All right, what up, what up, what up, what up? You already know what to do. It's your boy, B-Phil, and it's time to learn something new. So today, we're gonna talk about a new library that just hit the block. It's Light Rag. Uh, it's in alpha phase. It's gonna be out in beta coming here soon, but I went ahead and started utilizing it and adopting it to a previous workflow that I have, and we're gonna look at that today. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. So we're here on Light Rag's homepage and LightRag is the PyTorch library for building large language model applications. And we help developers with both building and optimizing retriever, agent, generator, pipelines, or RAG, right? So new take on RAG, all right, you know, you know, you yeah, know. It is light, modular, and robust. And I've seen that too. Uh, if you've seen my previous videos, you've seen that I use DSPy first to do the initial rollout. What had happened there was, <laughs> be honest with you, I wasn't trying to implement the async client with um, the async client with Anthropic, and understanding the underlying structure was a little difficult for me to grok. Then I moved it to Instructor, which it's currently utilizing today. So if we go offers.bpdata.io, you see here, right? It's just a very simple web page. You see it's an offer generator and it's say migrate a thousand servers. And behind the scenes, what this is doing is it's utilizing Instructor. And so basically I was able to do a similar thing with DSPy in Instructor, except for it was a little, a little bit more hodgepodge. And when I say that, Instructor is meant to be very lightweight and you're supposed to be able to build everything around it. Now, when I re-implemented this same workflow in LightRag, it gives you a bit more composability, meaning a little bit more structure in how you chain particular parts of your workflow together, which is what I think is like a happy median in between. And you still get those data structures that you like. Um, instead of Pydantic, it uses data classes. And so you can see here, we have a component, and this is just simple QA. We have our you know, typical initializing the class. And then the, the abstraction here, or really, the, yeah, the component abstraction here is this call. And you can implement this call, and it's similar to the forward method. You can see here, right, you, this PyTorch module, it implements this forward method. And when you go to DSPy, it implements a forward method as well for the actual modules you're creating too. So, this gives you like <laughs> the implementation side, the simple impl implementation and re-implementation of your own LLMs. And I, when you look at the code, it, it's quite simple to re-implement your own. And then it gives you this composability. So I've talked enough here. Let's just jump into the code. So we're going to go ahead and, and I'm going to bring them up side by side so you can kind of see what I was looking at here. So. This is the current implementation and it's a little sloppy. I mean, let me format it a little bit. And I, you know, I pasted prompts in here. I could probably move these prompts, right? As you'll see in the um, library I have now. And then I went ahead and abstracted a particular run out into its own method, right? And this is all my own creation. So it doesn't look as clean as you would get with someone who's put a lot of thought and uh, care into building a library that'll help you do a lot of this. So let me enlarge this for you. And so you can see just the general workflow here is I have this offer generation module, right? I, I by default, it has some trace and this is how we're sending data to length views. Light rag has something similar to this, except for they give you tracing out of the box into your local directory, which I think would prove to be useful. I'll implement that in a future iteration, but you can see I have this run generation and then I start to just define these functions that generate sub problems, generate problems, right? And then I go ahead and return all those together. And on the front end, if this is done generating, 
Once you send in your problem, it'll go ahead and output this problem here, potential downtime, service interruptions, and you can look at sub problems that you could face, assess the current system architecture and infrastructure to understand potential impact, right? And then any objections that your potential client may have, migration plan does not adequately address the potential for downtime, service interruptions, good stuff. And then it generates some solutions for you. So do it yourself, done for you and done with you. So based on my analysis of your current system architecture provides you with the detailed migration plan that you can use to minimize downtime and service interruptions. So you get the point. Basically what I'm doing on the back end is I'm using Instructor currently to do this. And of course I pass this to this fast API endpoint. Um, this is the 1.0 version in light rack. And so here, what I've done is, you know, I, again, like I said, I could clean up the actual props here. And so I went ahead and just dumped those in their own folder and file. And these are the same prompts. I just had to modify them because Light Rag uses uh, Jinja 2, I believe it is, templating. So that was something I had to do. Next, what I went ahead and did here is, and it's interesting because I don't actually load, oh, I, I don't load the environment, which is fascinating that it still actually worked. So it's loading the environment somewhere else. So I had to use the component and sequential component which this allows for some really neat composability features. And this is just the base level component that I was talking about previously. And then what I did from there is I just created a bunch of generators to encapsulate each part of the actual generation of these solutions. And so, oh yeah, oh yeah, by the way, on this, you can export the Excel too. So you can get all this in Excel format on the website. Just super simple, right? Super, super simple. So. Basically, back to the code, I went ahead and made a component for each one of these generators. So first I generate the problems, then I generate the sub problems, then I generate objections, and then I generate the solutions. And so finally what I do is I just orchestrate these using sequential. And the cool thing about this is I pass the output from this particular generator or component into the input of the next component. And all of this can be done by just simply making sure you stub out these calls correctly. So you can see here in my first problem, I return some problems and then I go ahead and I'm going to receive problems here. Right. And then I just loop through those and then I call the generator and so on and so forth. The next portion of this is the actual data class to get the structured output from. And so how it does, how LightRag does this is it uses data classes, which is a native Python typing system. So previously we used Pydantic. That's what a majority of the libraries use. Uh, DSPy uses it, Instructor uses it, and you can even use it with some of the other libraries like Langchain and Llama Index. But you see here, this one is using data classes and there's a custom data class class <laughs> that you, you go ahead and define as these types. And you can find the reason why this is. So if we go here, we can go and find the data class and you can read more about the design here, but there's a reason why this covers, so we can read it here. It generates the schema and signatures, lets the host to describe the data format to the LLMs. It allows you to convert the data instance to a JSON or YAML string to show the data examples to the LLM. And it gives you the functionality to load data instances from a JSON or YAML string. So this is what this is doing when you're actually um, subclassing your actual class with this. So basically you can see here, I've defined is very, very similar to the other models, except for they're using data classes now. One thing to note, really there's not too much to note here, it, it, just in the definition, but when I go ahead and specify the actual output format string, what I'm doing is I'm using some format instructions. And it's actually interesting because I use this here but then 
I, I had to actually go back to using these format class because I had a custom prompt. And if we look at our prompts here, what I'm doing is I'm passing in the JSON schema here. And so instead of the prompt that it gives you out of the box, which I can just show you really quickly. So if I go ahead and pull one of these JSON parsers, I can specify it down here. And we're just gonna go ahead and define all of this. And then we're gonna go ahead and run this. And then what we wanna do is we wanna say JSON parser.format instructions. And then we can go ahead and look at what the instructions look like. And it says, your output should be formatted as a standard JSON instance with the following schema. And it gives the schema, right? So it wraps it in a way where it's giving the prompt. But as you see, I have my own way that I wanna go ahead and show the model my JSON schema. So what you can do, and I think this is really neat, is you can go ahead and format these class strings. So I can go do this. Let me go ahead and just copy and paste this here. So I can go off of the JSON parser, or rather off of the actual class. So let's just go ahead and say sub problems. And we'll say dot format class string and we'll get the signature in JSON. And so you can see this previous one right here, this is the same thing. And as it says, it's less tokens. So you could still do something like, let's go uh, JSON, I think it's to JSON signature. I think that might be it. There is a, another way that it was doing this, I was looking at earlier. But regardless, you can, you can honestly, you can just do two JSON signature here. Um, I wanted to do JSON to schema. That's what I was looking for. You can look here and this is the actual schema. And you know, it, you can see that it takes away some, and it looks like it's interesting here. It's all one line here, it's escaping it. I'm gonna take some of the new line stuff out. So you get a good idea of like, you could do two schema and you could put that in there as well. Or you could just go ahead and do this JSON schema, which we can go ahead and test these things as well. And I probably will test these a bit more. So anyways, you can see that this is what basically what I'm doing. I have this JSON parser. And let's dive a little bit deeper into these actual components here. So we have an output parser. And what's gonna happen with this is it's gonna go ahead and be output parser. So <laughs> let's just go ahead and look, look at what that actually does. Let's go ahead and find that in the code here. So we'll go to our generator and I'm gonna see generator output, which you can see here, this is actually what you're gonna get for from the generator output, which is really good because you can return it as an error. So if this is none, then you can do something. So this is reminiscent of some statically typed language, more compiled style, where you wanna go ahead and catch and do something with these errors, but you wanna still continue. We can go ahead and look at these parsers output parsers. There's something I'm looking for here, but I'm probably not gonna find it in this video. Right here, output processor, I believe this is what it is. Uh, no, it's not the output, yeah, right here, output processor. So output is a component or chain components via sequential to process the raw response to desired format. So if no output, Provided it is decided by the model client, often returning the raw string. So how I'm actually doing this is slightly wrong here. So I went, <laughs> um, and you can see, like I have these JSON parsers here, and I'm just passing these to this output processor. But what I really actually need to be doing, so for down here, I was having some issues where I have this set here but I have these objections uh, from the previous one. I had like a list of something and this JSON parser was actually probably gonna just try and pass in the actual JSON output for it. 
And then I went ahead and just changed this to be a different type of output. And it looks like in this call here, it's actually slightly overriding it. So overriding whatever this is. And so I'll have to go back and play around with that. But I did get the initial first pass, y'all. So we can go ahead and run this. And we can see how it works. And it's just going to go through and, and do what it typically does, right? It's going to get those sub problems, build those sub problems up, and then go ahead and build up the objections. And then from there, we start building up the solutions. And you can see it's working quite nicely. One thing you can see here as well is it's logging these on each call. So from my understanding, it has tracing built in, which is actually really good. And you see here, I don't have some description here, which it made it a little, little jank on my part. But you can see these outputs, right? It's gonna give us the standard output, which I really, or excuse me, the output that you would expect from Anthropic, which you can go ahead and use their tracing module to store it locally. And then of course, if you wanted to, you can instrument these calls, just like I've done in the previous example. Let's go here. The instructor example. So if we go here and look at this, we actually, where is it at? I don't think, oh, you know what? I'm actually in this generation up here. I'm actually tracing it here. So I do another generation in each one of these run generations and then I just append it to the trace, which I define up here. So it's not exactly the same. If we look at the previous implementation, let's go to our modules here. And I was doing something. So like right here, I was doing this ob observe and then I was saying as generation. And then what I would do is I would get the trace and then I would go ahead right here, right? I will update the, the current observation and then dump it, right? So all of these would happen as the initial trace and how this works is a little bit more involved than I like to dive into here, but you could do something similar with Lyrag as well because it's just a decorator. And so you see here, we have all of the solutions that have been generated here. Now, this is very, <laughs> Um, fuzzy, you, you can't really read a lot of this, but I just wanted to give you the ideals of what it looks like to adapt this into a new library effectively. And so this was done in what, 167 lines where we're actually expanding each of the parameters for <laughs> the different functions on their own lines. So it's actually quite, quite light depending on how you determine light. So we look at these and let's go ahead and look at instructor. So we import a good amount here, about 12 lines of imports, about 12 lines of imports. If we move this, it's 11 lines. So, I mean, I guess you could say it's a little bit less uh, lines import and we could actually remove this data class here. We could remove some of these imports as well and we can remove that because we're obviously not using it. We can remove this prompt because we're not using that here as well. So, I mean, you know, it seems like less imports as well from what I was already doing, less code. So overall, I think this is a pretty cool solution thus far. I'm gonna go ahead and play around with it and make a few additional videos on using some of the tracing and showing how you can go ahead and integrate that with length views. But overall, I think it's pretty cool. So anyways, let me know what you thought. Hit that like button or the dislike button, depending on what you thought, if you thought it was useful or not. Leave me a comment in the comment section below. Hit that subscribe button if you want to go ahead and see more videos like this. And of course, as always, I expect you people out there, you're builders. So go build something. It's your boy B-Phil. I'm out. Peace.